On the 8th of June 2020, as per the President of Ghana's directives, uh, we had the final year students of the tertiary institutions returning to school to complete a six-week um, you know, update on their courses so they can write exams finally. And then also on the 15th of June, we saw the final year students of the various senior high schools across the country, as well as the gold track uh, students of the second year senior high schools also returned to school. And that was fraught with some reports as to how some students may have contracted the virus. Of course, these reports were debunked by the school authorities. We're talking about Dissadel College and a few other schools um, in the various regions. Volta Region as well also had its fair share of reports. They have come out to debunk reports that students may have caught the virus. Now, on the 29th of June, which is next Monday, we'll see the BECE candidates also return to school to complete um, you know, their course so they can get ready for the exams. And many questions have come up as to whether these teenagers are really ready to manage themselves. I mean, we're talking about social distancing and also adhering to the safety protocols. And especially because a lot of these uh, junior high schools do not have boarding facilities. So we're going to be seeing a lot of these students commute from home to school on a daily basis. How safe would our students be? We'll be speaking to various stakeholders, including parents, as well as the Institute for Education Studies and the GES, to tell us more about preparations towards uh, the reopening of school for final year um, BC candidates as well. So look forward to that conversation and more. This is COVID-19 360. My name is Berla Mundi. Uh, my name is Anita Ikir Akufu. In the United States, with over 2.4 million cases being recorded, the Center for Disease Control says that figure may actually be 10 times more, and that is over 20 million cases are actually in the United States. And, and so that raises the conversation on whether the cases being recorded in the various countries are indeed the actual figures or we are under-reporting. And so we will be giving you more details on that right here, and also the figures as Ghana has recorded 460 more cases, taking our tally to 15,473. More recoveries have been recorded as well. So I'll be giving you all the breakdown as the show progresses. But you can get in touch with us via our social media pages, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And also our WhatsApp number is active, Bella. Absolutely. So we'll be speaking to parents. Get ready to tell us what your concerns are, especially if any of your children are getting ready to return to school. If you already have children in the secondary schools and you're worried about, you know, the safety precautions not being adhered to, uh, speak to us. Let us know what your thoughts are. But yesterday, uh, during the press briefing, Dr. Ansia Asari, who is a presidential advisor on health, uh, specifically for COVID-19, also did mention that mass testing in the country has come to an end. And so he mentioned that this, um, you know, made a lot of sense because um, it was having uh, a toll on the country's purse. And so as a result, they've decided not to do mass testing anymore, but would rather do contact tracing when someone is confirmed positive. And so this is just some updates we have for you. We also have some more news updates that will be coming your way with Della later on the show. Yesterday, the case count increased. Has it stayed the same? Has it increased further? Anita has all those details for us. And so like I mentioned earlier, 460 new cases have been recorded in Ghana. And so our confirmed cases now stands at 15,000. 473 with 11,431 people uh, you know being confirmed as recovered and discharged 95 deaths have been recorded so far in active cases at 3,947 the greater Accra region has 8,934 cases that is cumulatively from uh, the very first case we recorded so far in Ghana from the 12th of March up till uh, today the um Today, the 26th of yeah. June. And so the Ashanti region has 2,954 cases. The Western region with 1,257. And so these three regions are the highest in Ghana when we're talking about, uh, you know, regions with the highest number of cases. And then followed by the Central region with 798. Eastern region, 452. The Volta region with 321. Upper East region with 271. And let's go down. Uh, the Buna region has 
4, North East Region 4, a half region with 8, and so these three regions have below 10, and then the Upper West Region has 35, Savannah with 38, Buno East Region 47, Western North 94, Northern Region with 95. And then let's move on to uh, this new table that has been introduced on the Ghana Health Service website, and it gives you the region, the cases that have been recorded so far, the number of discharges or recoveries, and also the percentage of the recoveries or the recovery rate in every single region. And so let's start off with the Ahafu region, which has so far recorded eight cases. And out of that eight, one has been discharged. Earlier, no discharge had been made in that particular region, but now one has been discharged. And that is 12.5% recovery rate in the Ahafu region, the Ashanti region, 2,957 cases so far, 1,955 have been discharged. And that is 66.1 percent the Buna region four cases two out of the four have been discharged and that is 50 percent recovery rate in the Buna region Buna east 47 16 have been discharged that is 34.0 percent the central region 798 743 that is 93.1 percent of that figure have been discharged the eastern region with 452 cases 272 out of that figure have been discharged as well and that is 60.2 percent the greater Accra region which is the number one you know in ghana it has the highest number of cases with 8,984, very close to the 9,000 mark and out of that 6,697 people have been discharged and that is 74.5 percent the northern region with 95 cases so far 61 percent uh, 61 people have been discharged or confirmed as recovered and that is 64.2 percent now when we go to the northeast region four cases have been confirmed so far two out of the four have been uh, discharged and that is similar to that of the Buno region and that is also 50 percent recovery rate the ot region with 108 34 out of the 108 have been discharged so far and that is 31.5 percent recovery rate the savannah region has a 38 and out of it 37 people have been uh, discharged and that is 97.4 percent the upper east with 271 cases 40 recoveries 14.8 percent recovery rate the upper west 35 uh, people were confirmed as being COVID-19 positive. 35 have been discharged and that is 100% recovery rate for the Upper West Region. The voter with 321. 284 have been discharged and that is 88.5%. And then the Western Region with 1,257 out of it as well. 1,187 people have been discharged so far in the Western Region and that is 94.4%. And then finally, the Western North region 94 confirmed cases so far 65 out of it have been discharged and that is 69.1 percent and so when you put all of this together we have a total case count of 15,473 and then for the recoveries we have 11,431 and for the recovery rate as well in percentage we have 73.9 percent right here in Ghana now let's go up and take a look at another table that has to do with, uh, you know, number of tests that have been done so far, number of uh, out of that test, the ones that have been confirmed as positive in the various uh, parameters or the variations that have been given so far. And so for the routine surveillance, we have 100,048,000 tests test being done so far 6327 out of this 100 and 100,048 have been confirmed as positive given us a positivity rate of 6.32 for enhanced contact tracing 183,076 tests have been done so far and that out of that figure we have 9146 being confirmed as positive giving us a positivity rate for that particular parameter as five percent and so in total 283,124 tests have been done and 15,473 have been confirmed as positive right here in Ghana giving us
us a positivity rate of 5.47. And so on Ghana Health Service website, these are, uh, you know, the very important uh, details and also variations that we've been given and breakdowns that the website gives as well. So if you want more on also the tables, that gives you details into uh, date samples were taken and also number of cases. And also it gives you another table that gives you the distribution of COVID-19 cases and the moving averages as well. So if you are into all the details and you're interested in finding out what exactly is happening in Ghana, you have to visit this website. That is the Ghana Health Service website. And then you get, uh, you know, in totality all the details you need. And so that is what is happening right here in Ghana. In a bit, I'll be taking you to what is happening on the African continent and also globally on the Johns Hopkins website. But, voila, this is what it is looking like. Hmm. We are indeed recording high numbers. And again, the question would be that with the final year students of junior high schools across the country going back to school to prepare for the BEC exams. First of all, we want to find out, are these schools ready, um, you know, to handle any situation that may come up? Knowing very well that they are not operating boarding houses. And so these students might have to be commuting from home every day uh, to school. And also being teenagers, how well vested are they in understanding social distancing and adhering to the safety protocols? Parents get ready, we'll be having an interaction with you when we get back. It's COVID-19 360. 19360 and uh, we're glad that you tuned in. Now today we're talking to parents and even some GHS students as well. Share with us what your concerns are as you get ready to return to school uh, to complete the syllabus and prepare for the BEC exams that should start on Monday. I'm talking about going back to school by the way and so we'll pay some attention to that and through our conversation we'll be speaking to some stakeholders including the Ghana Education Service and the Institute uh, for Education Studies as well. Before that let's look at Africa's case count. So this week we've been giving you more updates on what is happening on the African continent and as a stance, the continent is still grappling with the rippling effect of the COVID-19 virus. But as of this morning, 348,305 confirmed cases on the African continent and out of that, 6,122 healthcare workers have been affected. 9,074 deaths have been recorded so far with recoveries at 166,842. And this week, South Africa, being the first on the African continent, rolled out a coronavirus vaccine trial this week. And the investor leading the pilot is the Oxford Jenner Institute. And some 4,000 participants are expected to take part in this vaccine trial. And then we're, we're looking forward to it going so well. And that will be some good news for the continent and also for the global community as well. But as of this morning, South Africa, in during the trial, still has 118,375 confirmed cases this morning. Egypt with 61,130 cases. Nigeria, 22,614. Ghana with 15,473. Cameroon with 12,500 and 92 and then algeria with 12,445. let's go to the recoveries and for the recovery south africa is leading and very close to the 60,000 mark when it comes to recovery so south africa has 59,974 and egypt 16,338 ghana 11,431 cameroon with 10,100 and then Algeria following closely with 8,920. Let's also look at the debts and see which countries are unfortunately being hit so hard when it comes to uh, debt related to COVID-19. And so Egypt is leading this pack with 2,533 debts. South Africa second with 2,292. Algeria with 878. And then Sudan with 556. For healthcare workers who have been affected, South Africa is leading in this parameter as well with 2,084 and then 14 healthcare workers have died. Nigeria still has 812 and then two healthcare workers have passed on. Cameroon has 455 healthcare workers who have been affected with three deaths and then Egypt 
with 350 initially. The number of deaths when it comes to doctors and nurses who have passed on in Egypt, it was at 19. But surprisingly, it has moved from 19 to 90 healthcare workers who have died in Egypt due to COVID-19. And so for that particular country, they are being hit really hard when it comes to, uh, you know, healthcare workers who are taking care of uh, COVID-19 patients in the various health facilities. And they are not just being overwhelmed, they are recording deaths as well, and that is pretty sad. When you come to Ghana, 227 healthcare workers have been affected. No death has been recorded so far. And then Niger has 184, Guinea-Bissau with 176. Now let's move over to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center dashboard and still 188 countries have recorded cases so far with 9,619,573 total confirmed cases, global deaths at 489,556 with recoveries at 4,849,802. Now the United States is leading with 2,422,312. And earlier I mentioned that experts, uh, you know, from the Center for Disease Control in the United States are saying that uh, the cases that are being recorded, that is a 2.4 million, which to some of us is a huge figure, may not in actual terms be the real figure because a lot more people have even had and recovered from the uh, virus without, you know, they being recorded as being COVID-19, but people have recorded the cases or have been infected by the virus. And so we're looking at 10 times this 2.4 million, which is over 20 million people who have been affected in the United States. And they have tested over 25 million people in the United States across the various states as well, with Florida, uh, Houston, Texas, and somewhere in Oklahoma also being, you know, the highest number of cases being recorded in these states. And that is it for the United States. But let's go to Brazil, where 1,228,114 cases have been recorded. And the president of Brazil, you know, every time he, he's, he's in the news and he's quite interesting and uh, sometimes some of his ideologies and his way of thinking is not in sync with most of the people in Brazil. But he tested for COVID-19. He, he uh, you know, went through the test and it came out negative some months back. But he, um, you know, made a statement that the results shouldn't be put in the public domain, even though now he's come out to say that the test was negative, but he still feels that he's having a few symptoms here and there. And so we'll go back and then get tested. And he still thinks he's negative, but he'll still undergo the test and then see what comes out of it. But uh, through all the controversies and everything that has been happening in Brazil, they are grappling with 1,228,114 confirmed cases. Now let's go to Russia where this week, they marked a parade for the World War II uh, Nazi war. And, you know, through all of it, they still have 619,936. And interestingly, in all these top three countries, despite the cases that are being recorded, despite everything that is happening there, they are easing restrictions and life is more or less going back to normal as people do not really, you know, uh, grabbed, they haven't grabbed how serious the virus is in these countries. And let's go to India, where 490,401 cases have been recorded so far. And in India, interestingly, there's a tradition where during lunchtime people walk to various tea spots and, you know, take some tea and have a chill time. But due to the virus, that is unable to happen. And so I read an article this morning that was asking the question that even after the coronavirus, will people still still walk up to these tea stands or tea stalls and then enjoy the tea they used to have. And you know, India is uh, the second highest producer of tea across the globe. And so that is a question on the minds of a lot of experts and tea lovers in India. Now let's go to the United Kingdom where 309,455 confirmed cases have been reported so far. But despite this high figure and they being the number five on the global uh, scale, they are looking forward to opening hotels, restaurants, and so many other uh, public places. Now let's move over to the recoveries 
where we have 4,849,802 recoveries. And Brazil has taken the lead in this parameter with 679,524 recoveries. Initially, the United States was leading here. And so that should tell you that Brazil is doing well when it comes to the recoveries. And now United States is second with 663,562 recoveries. Russia second, uh, third with 383,524, and then India with 285,637. For the global debts, 489,556 debts have been recorded so far, and this parameter, the United States, is leading with 124,415 debts, Brazil with 54,971, the United Kingdom with 43,314, and then Italy, 34,678, France with 29,755, and then Spain with 28,330 deaths. So this is what the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center dashboard is saying. And so these are some of the cases that have been recorded across the 188 countries globally. Initially, uh, barely a month or two ago, it was 153, and then it moved to the 188 countries. So the projection is at 10 million. 10 million cases are expected to be recorded, even though experts say that even that 10 million, it is times 10. And so meaning that on the global scale, the, the numbers were recorded are actually higher than what is being presented on the various websites. Bella, I don't know what you think about that. I mean, it's, it's interesting. And um, that just means that we all have a lot of work to do, um, you know, as individuals, as nations and as the world, um, you know. And so I hope that people really adhere to it, which is what we've been hammering on since we started this show, since Ghana recorded uh, cases as well. Make sure that you're adhering to it. And I'm not surprised that Egypt is recording a high, uh, you know, case count mm -hmm. in terms of doctors who yeah. have or health professionals who have died. Because I remember about a month ago, mm -hmm. we talked about how, um, you know, these health professionals were going on uh, a demonstration because of lack of PPE. So and it is reflecting now. Exactly, it is. And Egypt is one country that was hiding figures at a point because we spoke to some of their correspondents and it didn't look too good. It took them a long time mm -hmm. to even initiate a lockdown because they were only working with curfews. Uh, I think it was when they realized how serious the case had become that they initiated a lockdown. And so um, it's sad, but again, we hope that our leaders are taking a cue from what's happening in the various countries and are doing their very possible best to ensure that we bring it under control. Let's take a look at some of the stories we have for you uh, for news updates, including the fact that the Burundi president who lost his life some weeks ago, uh, suspected to be from coronavirus, will be laid to rest today. And other stories as well. Take a look. Welcome to News Update on COVID-19 360. The burial of former Burundi president Pierre Kurunziza will take place today in the administrative capital Jutiga. Government announced there is a solemn, somber mood in the capital and other parts of the country as the man who led the country for the last 15 years is given his final send-off. Government has urged the public to line up along the road from Karusi Hospital where he died to Jutiga Stadium for the last honors. Foreign donors pledged $1.8 billion at a conference hosted by Germany to help Sudan ease an economic crisis hampering its transition towards democracy after the fall of Omar al Bashir. The European Union pledged 312 million euros, the United States 356.2 million dollars, Germany 150 million euros, France 100 million euros, and Britain 150 million pounds for humanitarian and development programs, chief among them planned cash transfer to poor families with the help of the World Bank officials said on an online event. Saudi Arabia, which said it had given Sudan 500 million dollars over the past year, donated only 10 million dollars. The United Arab Emirates donated $50 million. The president of Guinea-Bissau, Imaru Susuko Mbalu, announced a one-month extension of the state of emergency decreed at the end of March to combat the coronavirus, double the usual duration, adding that there would no longer be a curfew. The state of emergency had been extended, but there is no curfew, President Mbalu told reporters. According to the presidential decree issued in the wake, the head of state believes that the period of 15 days, the duration so far of six successive state of emergency measures taken, is insufficient for an adequate and effective response to the health 
health situation. Only airports to the south of French capital Paris has reopened for the first time in nearly three months after it was closed because of the coronavirus pandemic on March 31. The first flight took off early on Friday morning and was hosed down by firefighters with a water salute before it took off to the runway. Travelers will be able to fly to 25 destinations and there will be 74 flights on Friday compared to 600 normally, Augustine De Romanet, chairman of Paris Airport to Preta ADP, told French Radio. And that's all we have for you on News Update right here. Welcome back. And that was News Update. And so uh, we'll be speaking to some parents and also um, some GHS students, if you may, uh, to tell us what your concerns are as you prepare to go back to school on Monday. Of course, the BC uh, will be happening shortly. And so we're preparing you for the final exams. Now, you can keep these numbers when it's time to call. Uh, then you dial them 030-276-3470. Again, 030-276-3470. Uh, we'll be speaking to Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi shortly. And I will touch a bit on this particular topic, but also on the fact that, um, you know, the Ghana Health Service has indicated that there's no more going to be mass testing for coronavirus. And that's because, um, you know, it's putting a strain on government's purse. And so they would rather do contact tracing, um, you know, uh, based on who tests positive or not. And so we'll be asking Dr. Bertha what her thoughts are on this particular issue, especially knowing very well that we are not out of the woods yet. Yesterday it was indicated said that we have not even reached our peak and so if that's the case with mass testing is that not how we have this situation under control so we'll be asking those questions and more again it's COVID-19 360 we'll be right back Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi has just joined us. She's an infectious disease specialist. And this segment, a lot of people look forward to. And so, Dr. Bertha, great job so far. Everybody looks forward to hearing from you what you have to say about COVID-19. I hope you've had a good week. I did. Thank you very much. And thank you for letting me know that. And good morning to you and good morning to everyone in your audience in Ghana. All right. So first question I want to ask. So Dr. Nsiasari, who um, is a presidential advisor on health, has indicated that government has decided to end its targeted mass testing for COVID-19. We do know that we keep recording a uh, high number of cases. And so clearly we are not out of the woods yet. Ending mass testing, is that a good idea at this point? Well, I don't think so because if the premise is that they want to focus on contact tracing, then in essence they're saying that they would like to just focus on the 20% of people who would present with symptoms because we're now six months into the epidemic or the pandemic and that we have been made to clearly understand that even when you have a people confined on a ship like the two ships i keep referring to the u.s naval ship and the first ship princess diamond that was docked off of tokyo where 3500 people got infected we now know that at least 80 percent of people will have mild symptoms and a whopping 47 percent will completely be asymptomatic meaning not only are they pre-symptomatic, meaning they'll develop symptoms somewhere along the line, but they will have no symptoms at all. And specifically looking at the data in Ghana, which has been presented in various places, we're finding that a lot of our positive patients are in their 20s and 30s, and their immune system is said that they will not exhibit symptoms. Unfortunately, they are the ones who will transmit to our diabetics our hypertensives, people with lung disease and people with kidney disease. And we have a lot of these pre-morbid, undiagnosed conditions in Ghana. So I think that strategy would backfire because what would happen is that they would find these patients who would be exposed to the patients they're not testing. And so I don't think it's, um, I, I, would, I don't support that um, idea. Because if you take a country, a country like South Korea, mm. pretty much what they did was they didn't go on lockdown. 
all they did was test, test, test. And they had really sophisticated PCR machines which were testing up to a million a day. They were even asking other countries to bring them their cases. Yeah. And the WHO right from the get-go has said, test, test, even if you don't lock down, just make sure you keep testing because it is only when you find the cases that you'll be able to do contact tracing. And I'm not sure what all the constraints are. Um, it was more of financial constraints because he talked about how it was having uh, an economic effect on us, especially because it cost a lot uh, to embark on mass testing. But should that be a fair enough excuse? Yeah, um, I, he, he and I are on good terms. I will, I will call him for maybe a deeper understanding. But um, at any point in time, you have to evaluate your surroundings and prioritize what is important. At this time, COVID-19 is slowing down our economy. And so if you focus on the economy and not tackle it, um, in three, today is Friday, so yes. I'm allowed meaning if you are the termite or the insect that lives in the dry wood you know the wood they used to make fire at that yeah. time you can run away from the fire all you want it will come and find you at some point so mm. i think it's better to adopt a bold mass testing strategy and find all our cases instead of, you know, and this week, for example, the U.S. president has been quoted in, in, in rally saying that he asked them to slow down testing. Mm. I think a lot of the testing makes, the numbers make the leadership feel uncomfortable, but that's not, this, this COVID-19, nobody asked it to come into the world. It's no personal leaders, you know, fault if it's spreading, but their decisions greatly affect how it's going to spread and the policies that are going to be made to curb it. Now, one other thing that they mentioned was the fact that, um, you know, this is not a clear cut solution to curing the virus, especially because even if they conduct mass testing today, two days later, whoever they may have tested uh, that came out negative might get in contact with another person who is positive and they might catch the virus. So that really defeats the purpose of mass testing. No, it doesn't. I mean, unless we're saying that after we test, we're not going to do contact tracing because that's the whole point, right? You want to find your cases so that you can isolate them. We've changed our policy from double testing those who are recovering with the hope that it will free us to be able to do these things. You want to find the cases and find their contact. I, I mean, these are the basic principles from day one. From WHO, even when we knew, before we knew we were going to hit 9 million, find your cases, isolate them, make sure you find their contacts, treat them, discharge them well. These are the basic tenets. So um, we cannot run away from that and hmm. say that it's, it's not going to backfire. We, we, have to, we have to do what we have to do. Hmm. I see. Anyway, now moving away from that, let's talk about junior high school students who are going back to school starting Monday. These are the final year students, unlike the tertiary and the secondary um, schools where we have boarding facilities. A lot of these junior high schools do not have boarding facilities. And, you know, the worry is that with children commuting to and from school, they could come in contact with so many people and that also endangers them because you never know where they could pick the virus from. What can we do to safeguard the health of these students as they go back to school? Um, well, I think they should keep up with the wearing of masks and maybe we can turn these young ones into rather COVID-19 advocates. Mm. They should look out for people who sit next to them who are not wearing their masks. You know, instead of the police um, being the main people watching out, we can educate them to a point where on their way home and uh, back from school, they're the ones telling adults, please put on your mask to protect me. You know, we could come up with a slogan like that. Put on your mask to protect me and um, make sure they're washing their hands and, 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 and the whole public, you know, especially if they're day students. It's a real, it's a real problem that mm. um, the things that were done in 1918 to stop the epidemic, um, modern day society has just decided to do the opposite, you know. Mm. 
and not just Ghana, all over the world, people are behaving as if there's nothing. And yesterday, the U.S. recorded its highest number of cases. Why? Mm. A few weeks ago, people hit the beaches. People yeah. were behaving like there was nothing. And so that is what we see. So we, we have clearly have to be very careful. But did we necessarily have to open up the schools, especially for these teenagers? Because again, we cannot guarantee how many of them would really adhere to the social distancing protocols and the other safety measures as well. Could we have at least protected them by allowing them to still stay home and prepare for the BEC? Yes, exactly. And not just them, because now we know that apart from the very few patients who will present with Kawasaki-like syndrome, uh, most of them would, would actually bear the brunt of this disease quite well. But it's the fact that they'll go home to grandma um, Koko at home or grandma Kafui at home and infect grandma who doesn't have what it takes to fight this disease, th that is the concern. Hmm. This is scary. And, uh, well, let's see how that goes. But, Dr. Bertha, so since yesterday, we've decided to adopt the wearing of face shields instead of face masks. I know we've touched on this, but there's been a concern that the face shield alone cannot protect you from COVID-19 and you'd still need to wear a face mask. Is that really true? Oh, well, yesterday I was going to tell you your face mask looked so beautiful on you. I mean, you were sporting it so well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I forgot to tell you that. Thank you. Um, it looks very nice. Okay, so the role of the face shield and the mask, what the face shield does, and I'll send you some images of a, a nurse who was asked to wear a face shield for all her shifts. Mm. They took pictures of the moisture on her face before and after using some tagged technology, and you will be amazed. At the end of her eight-hour shift, the amount of um, fluorescent particles in her face in the area where there were no face shields was, well, there was no face shield was quite interesting. So the face shield has a big role to play in that it allows um, the infected person's droplets to fall inside of the shield. Mm. And those who are also, um, who, yeah, mostly those who are infected. For you who are not infected, it allows people's droplets coming, instead of coming straight to you, they fall on the outside. In reality, then you have to clean it every day and then wash your hands. Mm. Um, the thing about the difference between the face shield and the face mask is that it sort of writes against your nose and mouth. So instead of the droplets having the opportunity to go around the face shield, they sort of land right on the inside. So I think in terms of protection, the face mask would have a higher um, protection than the face shield. Now, the next thing I'm about to say, anytime I say it, um, people sometimes get upset, but it is the truth. And so if you listen to most of the language around face shields, this is what we say. If we all wear face shields, it protects everybody. The virus measures 120 nanometers, okay? Mm. If you research into any fabric science literature, telling you the size of those square little pieces between fabric. The smallest is 25 microns and the largest is 500 microns. Now, a micron is a thousand times a nanometer, okay? So mm. we're looking at a pore size of 25,000 nanometers to 500,000 nanometers versus a virus that measures 120 nanometers. What it means is that the virus is about 2,000 times larger than the smallest cloth in a face mask, mm. the smallest hole in a face mask. Why is a face mask still protective? The thought is that because it travels in droplets, these droplets will not be able to go through those pores. But in reality, the virus itself can go through those pores if left to it alone. We're just trusting it doesn't go through. What am I saying? In essence, the double-layered face cloth mask is useful, but the virus is way tinier, several thousand fold tinier than any hole in any cloth face mask. And that is why healthcare workers don't wear it. So I think that it is better to combine the face mask with a shield than to wear the shield alone. Mm. Okay. Okay. So that means moving forward, it's either I go for the nose mask or if I decide to wear the face shield, then I have to wear it along with a nose mask. Right. If you if you are if you are going to interact with people, like you're having an interview where there are people sitting in front of you, 
it's better to wear your face mask and you can still sport your face shield if you're by yourself like when you're in front of the screen um the face shield is good because it looks really nice on you um thank yes. you <laughs> so, for your safety i think the face shield is i mean the face mask is better and you can combine it you know okay like they do in the hospitals interesting okay on that note we have a few messages and a few questions so dr bertha hold on sure. anita i'll take them and then we'll come back to you okay this one says good morning bella and anita i'm getting scared upon hearing the number of confirmed cases shooting up to fifteen thousand plus already what are we still not doing right upon all the education on the virus and precautions to be taken to avoid the spread of the virus? I'm still wondering if it is still advisable for students to go to school when the numbers are still increasing significantly. And that is Wasila from Ashaman. Okay, let me take um, another one that says, Good morning, Bella and Anita. As for uh, my brother's school, dear, they have a boarding facility, so they've been asked to report on Sunday. They went to work this morning, and we won't be going there to visit him. That was the instructions. Okay, okay. I think there was there was a question that had to do with uh, asymptomatic patients recovering, and if it's possible for even asymptomatic patients to recover as well. So I guess uh, Dr. Bertha can handle that. Okay, we'll take that final question. Dr. Bertha, and then we'll wrap up with her. Dr. Bertha, so asymptomatic yes. patients, can they recover at all? Oh, yes. I mean, they almost like, I would say they, they recovered before they, they, you know, they were even discovered. So asymptomatic patients are the class of patients who would never have symptoms. And if it wasn't for the test, they wouldn't even know that they've been infected. Unfortunately, they still have the power to transmit infections, um, as well as those who are symptomatic. Of course, if someone is symptomatic, People might even stay away from them a little bit. But yes, asymptomatic patients, um, there's no real recovery in terms of clinical recovery, but there's such a thing as biologic recovery. So they would measure their antibodies and everything to show that their antibody levels were positive and that it went down um, gradually. But what we also do know about this class of people is that they never actually develop very high antibody levels and their antibody levels do not stay as long. And Bella, the other thing we're finding in the last week, you know, in the past, we've always assumed mm. that because this virus shares a lot of um, genetic material with the SARS virus, whose um, antibody levels stayed for three to five years, we've always projected that, well, this will behave the same. This week, studies have come out showing that um, the antibody levels only last for three to five months. So that's mm. very, you know, mm. that's a bit okay. concerning that, you know, giving room for reinfection, etc. Okay, so I'll let you break that down later um, next week for us. Uh, but until then, thank you so much again for your time this week, Dr. Bertha Sewa Ai, And we wish you the very best this weekend. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we'll cross over to Anita now to read some more messages. Remember, uh, we'll be taking your uh, concerns as to what you think about final year GHS students going back to school on a Monday, knowing very well um, how very unlikely it is for all of them to be able to adhere to the safety protocols. And also, again, uh, because they don't have boarding houses in most of these junior high schools, commuting from home to school and back could pose as a challenge. And so what are your concerns? You can call us, uh, say these numbers quickly, and then you can call us when we are back. Uh, it's also on your screen, 030 2763470. And so we'll take messages. When we come back, we'll have that conversation. Okay, this one coming from William in Kumasa says, Please, Media General, I want to understand something. The president said schools that are not fumigated should not open. Can we teachers be assured that if, for instance, my school is not fumigated and because of that I fail to go to school, the district director will not get at me? Hmm. Okay, the next one coming from Solomon Armstrong says, My son is in infant swim school and information reaching me is that class starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 3 p.m. We can't obey simple... Uh, we can't obey simple rules for our children to go to school if we're afraid. Hmm, Ghana. Hi, Bella and Anita. Concerning the partial reopening of schools, how are community day schools going to operate now that the school is a day school? And that is coming from Kelvin Asamoah from Power and Mighty 
in just kind okay hi tv3 in fact we are not ready because uh, because the government uh, promised two face mask on arrival but they gave one currently when you come to my school these children are not wearing the mask and when you ask them some say it's dirty and smelling some have come back but they are living in fear some parents too have called that they won't allow the awards to return to school now the life on campus currently is really full of fear and panic and that is from Kwame in Akachi in the Volta region and this is um, a general notice on one of the hostels in the Ashanti region and that is the KNUST to be specific and this is saying that the management of well the name of the hostel has been uh, you know bled a little and this one says the management of the hostel wish to bring to your attention that the dean of students has instructed us not to allow any students into our hostel due to that all students are supposed to leave the premise by saturday the 27th of june 2020 and anyone with concerns should contact the dean of students through his or her heads of department for them to communicate to us thanks for your Operation and it is signed by the manager. And this uh, it follows up with Dear Bella, I'm a final year student in KNUST and I can attest to the fact that the six weeks classroom work and four weeks for exam thing is not working here in KNUST. As I text now, my hostel is evacuating all students and they claim it's a directive from the Dean of Students. Here is proof. So uh, he actually sent the proof and everything that has to do with this issue. We'll look into it and then give you more details on that. And so the next one says, let us not deceive ourselves. These junior high school pupils are with us in our homes and nothing triggers them on this virus. They live normal lives. Can the few teachers in our junior high schools manage them better than being at home? Okay, we are definitely not ready to leave our kids to go back to school. I feel very soon the consequences of these actions will start being obvious and then it will be too late and already out of hands. Hmm. Uh, good morning, Nana. Nana Jay, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great, than you? I'm fine, thank you. So tell me, what are your concerns? Uh -huh. So my concern is um, the DHS student. Mm. They, they have to go to school and to come back home every day. Sorry, you will have to turn down the volume of your TV set. It's giving us feedback. Uh, yes. All right, I'm doing that. Okay. Nana I'm Jay. That. I'm saying that. All right. I'm so tell me, what are your concerns again, please? I'm saying that our brothers and sisters are to go to school and come back home every day. I mean, the day she's student. Yes. Yes. And my problem is, there are no boarding schools for them. And these are the same children who, go to, who are playing the communities and they are going to their friends' home to play and all these stuff. So... I don't get it when they have to go to school um, with no boarding school. Is that really a problem? Because these kids are not staying home. They are playing around. I don't know if you get my point. Yeah. But we're talking about the final year JHS students for starters. And so don't you think that at least they would better handle, um, you know, the adherence to the safety protocols? Yeah. I, these, these people are like 14, 15, and they know what's going on. Mm. So I think that they should know what to do and they should adhere to protocol by wearing their nose mask and then uh, with the social distancing, they might be able to do it. Okay. Because if they are to go to their friend's home and play around in their communities, they must know what to do for their final exams. Okay, no problem. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling us. And you can also call us as well. The numbers are on your screens. Tell us what you think about these junior high school students who are going back to school uh, to get ready for the BECE. We'll also be picking the thoughts of Mr. Peter Antipate, and he is the executive director for IFES, which is Institute uh, for Education Studies. Good morning, Mr. Peter uh, Antipate. I think I would have to unmute you uh, quickly, so give me a minute. Let me do that. Okay. Okay, I think you have. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Kindly hold on. Sorry, I have another caller. Hilda uh, is calling us from Tamale. Good morning, Hilda. Good morning. All right, Hilda, what are your concerns? I want to greet all of you. Okay, we can hear you, Hilda. Good morning. Good morning. Do you have any concerns about our topic of discussion for today? Okay, I guess not. Let's, let's go back to 
Mr. Peter anti party. And so, Peter, so far we've had the final year tertiary students as well as final year SHS and second year gold track students go back to school. Are you satisfied with how the various institutions have ready the, you know, their premises to receive the students? Thank you very much and good morning to your viewers. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't say I'm satisfied or um, we are not satisfied. Uh, we are still monitoring because um, uh, I think it's just almost two weeks since um, the tertiary students and the senior high school students got on campus. So uh, we, we would not be able to give a, a very fair um, uh, uh, appraisal of, okay. of what is going on on campus. But what we can say is that it seems that the government was able to provide all the ministry and then the Ghana Education Service were able to provide the needed um, uh, equipment in yeah. terms of the PPEs and then the Veronica buckets to the various schools. Uh, one or two schools had challenges and I, I'm, I'm, I'm told that they were quickly um, addressed by the relevant authorities. Mm. It also seems that the, most of the secondary schools, especially, were very prepared to meet or to receive the students. Although mm. there were challenges with the reporting time in some of the few of the of the secondary schools, most of them, in general, seems to have been very prepared, prepared to meet the students. For the tertiary students, they have already started lectures, and it, it, it seems that. They have been provided with the needed um, nose marks as they were promised. Yeah. And the, the issue of um, the uh, vertical buckets on uh, at the lecture campuses and then the social distances in the lecture rooms seems to be have, uh, have been ad adhered to. Okay. So, so far, things seems to, move, seems to be moving on as expected. But as I always say, it is too early for us to give a very... Um, um, Good appraiser mm. of how well we've been able to implement all the laid down protocols. I think okay. going into the second and then the third weeks, we'll be able to fully understand what is going on on campus and then come out fully to, to give a, a better appraiser of, 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 of the system. But I believe it's not too early to have some concerns about what has happened so far and also extending it to the junior high schools uh, that should be reopening to final year students on Monday. Do you have any major not concerns? At all. Of course, we have to learn from the challenges that we have witnessed with the reopening of the tertiary institutions and the senior high schools, and then use it to help us uh, improve on the reopening of the uh, uh, basic schools uh, uh, for the uh, BEC candidates. So we can learn from, from that, especially in terms of how the teachers have been handling the students on, on campus with respect to the senior high schools and, and how they, they have been able to interact with the students without getting close and um, the use of the, the the use of the face masks and and other things that have gone on in the senior high, uh, high school we can uh, draw lessons from them and then use that to improve on what we would do with the basic schools especially with the basic schools which they would have to come to campus and then go back each and every day we would need to be very uh, extra vigilant Okay. Well, we've also been joined by the Deputy Director General uh, of the Ghana Education Service, Mr. Kwabna B. Tando. Good morning, sir, and you're welcome. Good morning, Bella. And all right. Good morning to your viewers. Absolutely. We've heard you. Thank you so much. Now, first of all, we want your assessment of, uh, you know, the reopening of the various levels um, so far. What do you make of how we've adhered to the social distancing protocols and to the safety uh, measures as well? Well, Bella, the first, what, what I would say is that we, we are very happy with the uh, reopening so far in terms of all of the protocols uh, that have been put in place by the uh, various senior high schools. Uh, the coordination in terms of getting the PPEs to the schools, uh, how quickly the schools um, reported back to the headquarters and uh, for us to liaise with the senior minister's office about where there may be some challenges so that those challenges are quickly addressed. Mm. Uh, in terms of the organization on the ground, we, we are very happy. We are happy with the way our students have reported to school. 
uh, we are very happy with how parents have also really worked with their, uh, with their students as they were coming back to school. Mm. Uh, most parents didn't rely exclusively on the PPEs that government was, was going to provide. Yeah. Almost every student that we have interacted with also came home with their own PPEs. Mm. Uh, we're also very appreciative of a lot of the old student associations uh, and PTAs who have also done very well in terms of also organizing PPEs in order to help uh, our final year students complete yeah. um, their um, remaining semester as well as uh, right uh, their work. Okay. Um, and then for the gold track to also complete. So overall, uh, we think that it has gone fairly well. Okay, but already talking about PPEs, especially NOSMAS, we've had some schools in some regions complaining that their students have not received uh, the nose masks yet. And so they've had to rely on one or two that they brought from home. And we all know very well that that's not adequate. What's the plan moving forward? And, you know, we're expecting that hopefully these masks will be given before, um, you know, classes start. What's the plan? Well Bella, thank you so much for that. I think that's why I began by saying we are very happy with the coordination on mm -hmm. the ground. All right? We, we were supplying to 16 regions. We had divided the regions into 49 different zones. Um, and that's why I mentioned the fact that we are happy with how quickly the heads have coordinated and communicated that, in, that information back to us. Mm -hmm. It has gone back to the senior, senior minister's office. And where there are discrepancies, they are quickly being addressed. Okay. Uh, we are fortunate to be working uh, collaboratively also with the Ghana military who are able to move logistics as quickly as possible. Uh, and so, yes, there are a few isolated cases, but we are aware and quickly uh, those PPEs are being supplied to the schools where uh, they may not have received them. Uh, okay. Uh, but in that case, there have also been some fake reports debunked by authorities of the various schools about some students, um, you know, showing symptoms that could be likened to coronavirus. I, I remember there was an interview with the headmaster of the Dogono Senior High School who said uh, it had been brought under control and, you know, the students were not recording high temperatures anymore. There have been other reports in Adisco and other schools as well. How is the GES handling this, um, you know, to at least uh, reduce the, the fear and power? Panic that may arise as a result of some of these reports? Like that's, a, that's a very good question. What I would say is that it is rather unfortunate uh, that we live in a country that some dubious people I would want to um, create fake news only to create fear and panic. It is, it is unfortunate that it is, it is sad. Mm. You know, because at the end of the day, this is about our children. And so for any well-meaning and thinking adult to go and create fake news out there about a disco in Otogono and other schools. It's, it's, it's disheartening. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, as a country, we, we, need to, um, we need to shun from such things. And we need, to, we need to shame people who create fear and panic about children. But These they said there's no smoke without fire. School. Uh, and so for that, we, we, we think that it, it is unfortunate and it shouldn't have happened. But, you know, but we, we do have a national protocol in place. And that protocol includes ensuring that health, the, the health things are done when students come to school. Mm. You know, I, Bella, I would quickly like to add that before COVID-19, people were registering high temperatures. People mm. register high temperatures for malaria, for fever, for flu, you know, even for headaches, people register high temperatures. So yeah. high temperature alone does not indicate that an individual has COVID. But, but Mr. Tando, we cannot take chances at this point, can we? Need further investigation. Mr. Tando. We are only even measuring the high temperatures because we just want to be sure that if, because high temperature is one of the symptoms, that it is further investigated as quickly as possible. Okay. Mr. Tando, like I was saying, um, you know, there's the belief that there's no smoke without fire. And again, we're not in normal times. And so we cannot take chances. Um, maybe in the past, recording high temperatures could mean something else. But at this point, we, we cannot leave, um, you know, things to bear, especially knowing that it could be uh, as a result of coronavirus. Should we not act upon it instead of, you know, castigating no, 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 people we, who may put out... Think, thank you very much. But what I said is that we are acting upon it. Mm. Before COVID, we didn't even have the temperature guns that we are now supplying to school. Okay. But every single high recorded temperature is further investigated. It is part of our protocol. Mm. Right? And so, yes, because of COVID, you know, it has made us a lot more vigilant in our schools. It is one of the reasons why every single school
in the country now have a number of infrared monitor guns. Every single school in the country has Veronica bucket and, and soaps and hand sanitizers. And Bella, I, I assure you that whenever a high temperature is recorded in a student or in a staff, then it's reopening there is a further investigation. I can give you a, a good example okay. of how we are working very collaboratively with the Ghana Health Service on this. Mm. Well, I, I spoke to the headmaster of a popular senior uh, high school okay. uh, this morning, and he actually told me that he was very, very surprised that as soon as we announced that the schools were reopening, mm. the, health, the senior health officer at Treso actually came to him to say that we are your hospital and that we will be working very, very closely with you. It's not just a popular senior high school. It's happening all across the country. Mm -hmm. We are now collaborating very close. I assure all of our listeners, our parents, and anybody, all of our teachers, that we are um, taking the necessary action, especially when someone registered a high temperature or any of the other symptoms, to make sure we investigate and, and, and either rule out that it's not COVID or that it is COVID so that the additional protocols that need to be put in place are put in place. All right. Our, our, you know, and, and I would also want to thank the media because you've done a very good job in terms of communicating to the Ghanaian people mm. about the health protocols, about what they need to be aware of, and let, get, letting people be aware of these things. So we, we appreciate the work you are doing a lot. But Absolutely. I sincerely believe that it is a national effort. And, and it requires all of us. Our teachers are doing their best. They are in school and they are working with our students. Our students have come in full force because they want to complete. And, you know, our parents, for the most part, are also really supportive in terms of preparing their students to go back to school. Okay. We just want to continue to assure that we are working closely with the health professionals to address any, any challenge that we face in our schools. Absolutely. And finally, before I let you go, yesterday, TV3 News uh, broke a story about some three private teachers, uh, private school teachers who were conducting classes, um, you know, for students uh, on the back of the president's directive as well, uh, that, you know, teachers should not allow students into the school at all. Has this come to your table and how is the GS handling this? Um, I, I did. I did hear about it. It has not formally come to our table at the Ghana Education Service okay. because we do not regulate private schools. Mm. Private schools are, are, are regulated through uh, regulated through the Ministry of Education by National Inspectorate Board. Okay. But any school that is flouting the president's di directive, it, it's flouting the law because mm. the president's directive is backed by law. And so if there is such, I believe that the National Inspectorate Board will address that situation uh, and make sure that it is corrected. All right. Thank you so much, sir, for speaking to us. This is all time we'll allow. Mr. Kwabna B. Tando is the Deputy Director General of the Ghana Education Service. I'm coming back to Peter Anti Party. And Peter, again, back to the issue, um, you know, of some teachers organizing private studies for students. And this is clearly against the law. They were breaking the law. GES says, well, that is, um, you know, uh, the responsibility of the Ministry of Education to handle this matter. But what do you make of this? And what possibly could have led to them breaking the law um, so openly? Uh, th thank you. It's, it's quite unfortunate that we all set out to um, obey the directives from the uh, President of the Republic. And um, some others will want to do other things. We might, we, we might understand that at this time, a lot of people are having issues, especially those teaching the private sec area, uh, schools. They are having issues with um, um, their uh, salaries and other things. But that does not mean that it should go um, against the laws that we have all set out to obey. So I think that the Ghana Education Service should, should come out clearly to deal with this issue decisively. I, 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 I think that if um, we, 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 we want others to obey the laws, then we should set examples from those who go contrary to the laws that have been laid down. So the mm. Ghana Education Service, maybe the National Teaching Council, and, and then the National Accreditation Board, they, they, they should come out clearly to, to deal with this issue uh, decisively so that no other teacher, whether in the private or the public area, would, would venture into such uh, activity again. I see. I would have wanted to ask you some more, but my time is up. And so thank you so much, Mr. Peter Antipate.
And uh, we hope to speak to you next week, uh, especially on the Ghana Learning TV channels and what you think the long-term plan should be for the junior high school. So we'll definitely get back in touch with you next week. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And Mr. Peter Anti Pate is Executive Director for the Institute for Education Studies, IFES. And earlier we also spoke to the um, you know, executive, executive um, of, of Ghana Education Service. And so let's cross over to Anita, quite a mouthful, I must say. <laughs> let's read a few messages and then we'll wrap but up. But I think our time is up, Bella. Oh, our time is our up. Our time oh. is up. Oh, heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, I think we still covered a lot of areas this week. Yes. Um, you know, concerning COVID-19. And so we hope that you enjoyed it. And um, we're wishing you the very best of the week. And tomorrow we'll have the NPP officially announce um, you know, the flag bearer, of course, the presidential candidates, which we all know, as well as his <laughs> running mate. And so, of course, stay with TV3 so we can update you with all of that. My name, by the way, is Beryl Mundi. I've been doing this with... Anita Ikeo Have a beautiful weekend and don't forget to stay safe. We're back on Monday with so much more. Have a blessed weekend. <laughs>